Speaking of elite, he is Hi. Merrill Reese. He joins us now. Merrill, appreciate you coming aboard. How's your off time going? Good. A lot of golf, golf, and golf. <laughs> so, like, let me. What, what's a good round for Merrill Reese getting around? What, what's a good loop around the golf course for Merrill? A good loop would be somewhere between 80 and 85. Oh, yeah. So Merrill wins some money out there sometimes. Like $3. <laughs> Merrill has I'm, I'm a $3 not my, I'm, not my, I'm not high stakes, Mike Quick. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a dollar on the front, a dollar on the back, and a dollar overall. <laughs> Very good, man. I like those $3 Nassau's. All right, Merrill. Schedule drop last week. Um, Eagles are going to have the toughest schedule in the National Football League. I, I made this comment. They may not win the same amount of games as they did a year ago, but they may have a better football team this year because sometimes the records don't indicate how good you can be, especially when you've got the kind of lineup of teams that you're going to be playing against. Is that a fair comment? It's a fair comment, but one that I don't necessarily buy. I probably play less uh, attention to the schedule than 90% of the people you know. I never, and I'm, I'm telling you the truth, I never put the schedule down and go W, W, oh, this looks like an L, this likes a W. I mean, the Inquirer and their fine writers, the day after the schedule came out, put the whole schedule down and each writer wrote a synopsis, a synopsis of each game. Dan, we don't know who that team is going to be when we play them. We don't even know. We don't even know the names on those teams, what the personnel is compared with last season. There are dramatic changes every single year. We don't really know who the quarterback is going to be of the 49ers, for example. We don't know who's going to be healthy in the 15th game of the season for the Eagles or for their opponents. I mean, we can look at a stretch that – that stretch in the middle of the season with Kansas City and some of those tough teams. And on paper, on paper, it looks very, very foreboding. But we don't know. What are they? You might know better than I. What is there an average of between 16 and 22 new players on every team every year? That's, that's, a, that's about the turnover rate um, for the 1,400 players that are in the NFL, especially, again, as we get even closer to June. You know, with June 1 coming up with the uh, rosters being set at 90 going into camp for July, I mean, Merrill, you're going to see teams that are going to cut a bunch of players because of money. Yeah. So your roster's still going to turn over here in a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And and then, again, the, the injury situation. I mean, the Eagles added two very exciting running backs in the offseason, uh, DeAndre Swift, Rashad Penny. But these are guys who history tells us Missed quite a few games with injuries. You know, how, how are they going to be at various points of the season? I mean, Jalen Hurts, to me, I don't I don't have to be told about Jalen Hurts. To me, he showed who he is, what he is, how dedicated he is, how talented he is, how he even went back to Oklahoma over the weekend and was shown getting his cap and ground a gown and his master's degree. He's everything you want. He has nothing to prove. Although He's going to prove something every single week because that's Jalen Hurts. He never says, I am this. He says, this is where I want to be, and that's better every single day. But knowing all of that, do we know how his health is going to be? He could be the most durable quarterback in the – look how long Peyton Manning went on without missing a game. And then suddenly he had a neck injury and missed a season. So – we, you know, Brady, Brady had great health, but he missed the whole season with a torn ACL. But we don't know. We don't know these things. So to me, this is a good Eagles team. They are a very good Eagles team, and they should be able to win at least 12 games. If you want to, just based on how good they are. Can they win more? Yeah. But give me a team that let's say is on paper. All things being equal, just looking at them on paper against their opponents on paper. You take a team that is 10 and 7. If they have the wrong three injuries at the wrong part of the season, they could, with the snap of a finger, find themselves 7 and 10. 
And that's why the schedule to me only tells me how many times I'm going to have to do a night game on the road and come home <laughs> six o'clock in the morning exhausted. Or oh, and also how many times that you're going to have to go to that shit box in DC. Just thought <laughs> I'd throw that in there too. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's only once. <laughs> the dump. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Fair but, enough. So you know do what, you think you know this roster is as good as last the, year's roster? Dan, Dan, don't take any offense to this. I I I absolutely hate Hard Rock Stadium. And I do Florida. too. But you know why? Because they put us It's so far the, away. We're in the corner of an end zone yep. and with the naked eye, a third of the field is blocked from our vision. So I I don't know why I go down there, but I'm calling the game off a TV monitor. I, I I I refuse. They the University of Miami invites me every year to go to that place. But see, I like the old lady. I was an Orange Bowl man. I played my career at the Orange Bowl. Sure. And I'm sure you called a few games at I, the I Orange did. Bowl. Yes. Yes. And so to me, it was crickety, it was old. But I'll tell you what, between the Canes and the Dolphins back in those days when I played, I don't ever remember us losing weekends. And it was just really one of the great iconic stadiums, and I enjoyed yeah. really playing at the Orange well, Bowl. And that's that's why my favorite stadium to this day is Lambeau Field, because number one we can see, and number two, it's you, you look down and you just you just picture Lombardi with the frost coming out of his nose. You know, you you just you, it, it's so special. And I also aside aside from the link, which is quite good, I also love. MetLife Stadium, the Giants and Jets Stadium, because we have the best view in the world, and they were smart enough to construct scoreboards right behind the benches so that you don't have to look around every two minutes to see what the, the down and distance and the time. You just look down in the field, and it's in your vision, and it's a great stadium for the fans, great stadium. Now, I haven't been at the stadium in Los Angeles, but I have to also tell you that – I don't really love, and no matter how glamorous and beautiful they are, I, there's there's no indoor stadium that I love because football to me will always be an outdoor game. If you want to do it indoors, play arena football. Yeah. I just I just love. I not, some of them are beautiful, but I I love to play in the elements. Once upon a time, we were we were in Washington uh, years ago. They put us in a stadium. Uh, where where they closed the window, the window wasn't removable, and it's not removable in Kansas City anyhow. And I I said in Washington that day, I said to Mike, and it was a bad day. I said, Mike, was it RFK? And no, this was this that RFK. We were a million miles in the air, <laughs> sitting on little school seats like you have in the luncheonette where they pull out. Not you should have seen Stan Walters try to sit on one of those seats. The whole table went backwards, but, <laughs> but, but, but my quick is not Stan Walters. So I said, I hate being behind glass. I want to, I want to, I want to feel the game and you can't feel the game. So Mike said, this was very early in his first year as a, as an analyst. He said, you want to feel the game, go down there and let them hit you. I, <laughs> that's, that's great. By the end of the game, Mike said, I felt as if I were in a library. I hate this. And now they th then they moved us down in the Daniel Snyder era, and we're in the we're in the corner of the end zone, and we're guessing what happens on the other side of the fifty yard line. And Mike, and that's bad. But at least it's open. I would choose open every day over enclosed. And I can't stand. Do you like? No, 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 no. I, I, I triple like, cow cows. <laughs> Triple sow cows and figure skating and pair yeah. skating is for inside, not football. Do you like it? I like AT&T Stadium in Dallas when they open the roof. The scoreboard well, gets in the way of the fans on the other side. It hangs down too far, Merrill. And I told, I even told um, Stephen that um, a, a couple of years ago. I'm like, the, the, the view is not as good. It's a better stadium, obviously, than – than what the um, old Texas stadium was that I played in. But I just, it, it, the views aren't always the best in that Texas and at &T. No. Well, I originally, originally at the Texas stadium, we were down on that middle level. Yeah. Great views. Then they, zip, they took us up to the roof, but we were still outside and we could still see. So it wasn't, it wasn't great, but it wasn't horrible. 
But the but the the new AT and T Stadium, when the roof is open, it's okay. But you talk about that that television, the, the scoreboard. Uh, the scoreboard. Let me tell you something I learned. When they are across the uh, opposite forty, I am looking at that scoreboard. I'm watching television because we are far in the corner of the end zone, and Brad is and Babe Laufenberg, Brad Sham, Babe Laufenberg. Yeah. There to the left of us, they're even further into the end zone. And it was Brad who gave me the idea. He said, when they go past the 50 or the 40, start watching the board, just watching the board, because there's no way the human eye can uh, follow it that way. I, I have binoculars, but I, I cannot follow a passing play with the binoculars. You know, I, 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 they'll come up when there's a ball fumbled. They'll come up on a goal line stand. But you don't want to try and be a television cameraman. That's not your job. Well, you got to get Philly to get them binoculars working for you there a little better. <laughs> I'm tough. But, but the, we're in a good place at Lincoln Financial Field. And so, I might say, is the visiting broadcast. I used to say to the, to, I used to say to the Eagles, Washington gives us such a bad view. When their announcers come, instead of putting them in that nice view, put them in the men's room. <laughs> I got, I got to tell you a quick story about Lambeau. So my first time going there. Now, my first time playing the Packers, believe it or not, we used to play in Milwaukee. Yeah. Well, I've, and, I've, and, and like, I, Merrill, I had never been on the same sideline like in my life because this is where like the Braves played. They played at Milwaukee County. Actually, I have it right here. And, and, and I still have a program. And this is the program, Buccaneers, Milwaukee. And here, here it is right here, County Stadium. County Stadium. And so I'm running off the field, and James Lofton's like, down there, kid. And I'm going like, what do you mean, down? And you look around, you don't know where the hell you are. I played in a ballpark. And so that confused me because well, they like to, they used to go. like to play a game. They don't do that, obviously, any longer. Then I went to Lambeau. My uncle goes like this to me. He goes, hey, get the tour. I go, Lombardi put those coils in himself. I go, what? He goes, yeah, there's an old coil system that's in the tunnel. When you walk out, you can see it. Lombardi did this himself. And back in the day, Merrill, the steam used to come off the ground because it was so it was so cold out. It was like two degrees whenever you played them. Because we played in the old Central Division. And so the Bucks would go up and play them up there sometimes. And man, the steam would come off, and the players yeah. you could see them just laying on the field because it was so warm. And Vince actually put the coils in himself with his guys. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I I am still angry at Arizona, and the reason I'm angry at Arizona is the thing I I didn't feel badly about was they opened the roof for the game, that for the Super Bowl. That was that was great. That made it a much better stadium, and we were the home team. So we had home radio, so we were at least outside the 20. So that was great. But to this day, yeah, I, I gave a, a, a speech this morning up where my the station that I own is in Levittown to the Rotary Club. And the one thing they said to me was, Merle, were you, were you absolutely upset about the condition of that field where players couldn't get traction? Looked like that Pittsburgh. Race for a Super Bowl game to be played on a field in that kind of condition, that that is inexcusable to me. Absolutely. It looked like Pittsburgh's uh, surface, and that's traditionally one of the worst surfaces in the National Football League. You mentioned something, Merrill, about Jalen. And you mentioned, you know, I think this is a small thing, but I think it's a big thing. You know, when you go, how about Hertz going back and getting his degree? You know, a lot yeah. of people, I think, broached over that. But I think it's a prime example of him doing something that he's done his entire career. That is start something to finish it. Yeah. You know, he wanted to he wanted to finish being on the team in Alabama. Then he went to Oklahoma. Yeah. There's nothing that he starts that there's an open end to. And I think that that is something that has built the character of what you're seeing now in his development as a leader of the Eagles. Oh, there is a Lombardi trophy in his future and that of the Eagles. I don't know it'll be this year, next year. But in, in Jalen Hurts' Hertz's tenure, there will be a Lombardi trophy arriving here. I, I feel 
really confident about that. I mean, you never really know, but I, this guy is the leader that you dream about having, and and he will carry them there. Of course, you have to have the the lines and everything else, but but he to me is he's the best best quarterback in the NFC for sure right now. Merrill, do you have any concerns on what you have witnessed so far since Jalen Carter has become a Philadelphia Eagle? And how much responsibility do you think the Eagles will put on him when it comes to putting guardrails on him? Do you think they are going to? Because, again, if you look at John Morant or you look at some of the athletes we just get through talking about, a guy like Hertz who just embodies what leadership is all about, do you think the Eagles are going to – I'll say this kindly, put guardrails more so on him until he earns his stripes I, and I, the veterans I, understand I him more? Do you think they're just letting him be Jalen Carter right now? Well, uh, a little of both. I don't think they're putting guardrails around him. They're not going to keep him you know, surrounded by security people. But I think they're going to surround him with some very good teammates, some of whom he knows quite well, like Nolan Smith and the Kobe Dean. I mean, these... And, and, you know, Jordan Davis is a very mild-mannered but nice, nice, upstanding person. There's a lot of people that he already knows. And I think, I think they're going to show him. And I think and I pray that this guy realizes that he escaped disaster. I mean, aside from what he created, he could have been the one who was killed. He could have lost his life. And if things had gone in another direction... He may have cost himself millions of dollars. He could have dropped into the fourth round because of that incident. So he's lucky that a team stepped up and took him in the top 10 and that he's that kind of talent. And, and I only hope that he realizes that he dodged, he dodged a bullet. He really did. Or else he could have been the next Henry Ruggs. Absolutely. And you know, Maybe this is one of the reasons, you know, I thought about the money at first, Merrill, that they gave Fletcher Cox. I'm like, man, older guy, 10 million bucks. But now here's Howie again, crossing T's, dotting I's. You couldn't have a better leader, example of how to be a pro, how to play the position. It's funny, man. I think the Eagles are hoping that Jordan Davis or Jalen Carter beat him out because this is the passing of the baton. I yeah. think Fletcher Cox is so important to that group um, and to the development of that group this year. What an asset having him there teaching these young guys how to play the position. Well, may I, may I throw out another name? When people say to me, who's your favorite Eagle of all time? That's tough. That's a tough thing to, to answer, honestly, Dan, because there, there have been so many that I have had wonderful relationships with. and uh, I, I, But I will say this. There is nobody that I like more. There are people who I loved, like Reggie. But there's nobody that I love more than Brandon Graham. Brandon Graham is such an outstanding human being, such a team guy, never complains. Every time I meet Brandon Graham in the hall, which is quite often, my day just gets better. That's, that's Brandon Graham. My wife goes to the games. She wears her number 55 to Cindy. You know, you're the best. Sign Brandon Graham. So he's he's so special. Kelsey, Jason Kelsey. Someone asked me at my speech this morning, is Jason Kelsey as great a guy as he appears to be? And I had a one word answer. Yes. <laughs> yes, he is. And if you go through that locker room, you won't find better guys. I, I am sad when I see somebody like TJ Edwards leave. And I understand why he left and why he's getting big bucks and understand what the Eagles had to do under the salary cap. But what a great young man, as is Boston Scott, phenomenal. Miles Sanders, you go on and on because we know all about Hurts. You go all you go through that locker room. So I, I don't mean to omit anybody, but throughout that locker room, you, you say to me, point to, a, point to a really great guy, and you can put a blindfold on me, and play pin the tail on the donkey and have me point, and I'm pointing at a great guy. That it, it sounds cliche-ish, but that's what I think of this team. How about this, Merrill? Two last questions for you. Who was a closer-knit group? The Reggie White, Jerome Brown, 
Eagles or this group that you're covering now? Because it just seems that the chemistry that these guys have, it's really one of the best chemistries in all the National Football League. And I mean that when I call environment chemistry. Are there similarities between the two? I think you could say that in, same, in, in terms of the chemistry. But, uh, but the, the Reggie, Jerome, Clyde, Mike Golick, Mike Pitts, that, that group stayed together for a long time. Now this offensive line is, is getting that because now you have Mylotta and you have Landon Dickerson and you have Jason Kelsey. And now we'll see what they do with right guard. Could be a rookie, um, but we'll see. Um, or it, it could be somebody like Jack Driscoll or Cam Jurgens moves over there. We'll see. But but these lines staying together and the defensive front is staying together. Um, now, we hope that we're going to see uh, Jerome, uh, Jerome Davis come back. Uh, uh, Davis come back. This should Jordan Davis come back and play a much larger role. So you have Davis back there and you, you know you're going to get snaps for Jalen Carter. That's going to be great, too. So it, it will change. But when you talk about chemistry, this team has it. That team certainly had it. But in this day and age, in this day and age, there's more player movement every year. I don't absolutely. think there was a salary cap back then. Was there? Absolutely. So hey, finally here, Merrill, I, I, I've just been in, amazed by what Howie Roseman has done in this offseason. It's been spectacular has he been the better general manager that you've seen since you've been in the organization and that includes guys like joe banner and them dudes i mean do you think that he has set himself apart because like you just mentioned too those guys didn't have to deal with salary cap this guy's got him he's got they've got to re. and i say this about jimmy johnson you know jimmy when he built the cowboys back in the 90s there was no salary cap around then so jimmy could compile talent and put all that talent on the team, there wasn't the turnover mm-hmm. that you see. I think it's a monumental task every year for these GMs to keep the train rolling. Very tough. And what and, you have. You're right. you're right. Howie has done a great job. He's done a great job. He's made his mistakes. He, he drafted. He didn't take Jake, you know, Jefferson. Jefferson. You know, that was a mistake. There's no doubt about that. And But, you know. You I, make it up with Mulata, though, in the seventh. <laughs> well, give some credit to Give some credit to the best offensive line coach in the National Football League, Jeff Statland, who identified that talent, who scouted that talent. He's, you know, he, if you can't play for Statland and improve, boy, you can't play for anybody. I've been around a lot of coaches in the past 103 seasons, and I will tell you, Stout is the best offensive line coach I've ever been around. Merrill, I'll say this to you in closing. Jimmy Johnson, who was on a couple weeks ago, said this. He goes, I'll take a great D lineman over a D line coach any day, but he goes, you give me the offensive line coach. He goes, the most important guy and my offensive staff or in my coaching staff is my old line coach. The guy, Bill Callahan in Cleveland and the one in Philly are the two best guys that are in the national football league. And he goes, those guys are worth their price when it comes to the salaries you pay. And I don't think there's any coincidence with the turnover. The only guy that really survived Merrill was Stoutland. Yeah, yeah. And, well, also keep in mind that Stoutland loves what he's doing here. And I I don't have any facts and figures, but I think he is being paid quite well because it, there's no doubt in my mind that if Stout wanted to leave and become a head coach, that opportunity would have been there because he's got the personality. He coached uh, as a head coach for a while in Miami, and everybody loves him. He is demanding. He's at least he's the best. He's the best. But you know there are other great coaches, and uh, but and and I you know I understand what Jimmy Johnson is talking about because if you talk about the defensive line coach, and there are great ones. Tracy Rocker is terrific. Absolutely, I'm not minimizing his job, but you would have to. I, I think you're going to agree with this. You get a great group of defensive linemen, good defensive tackle coming in as a rookie. You say, there's the quarterback kill and let those pure instincts take over. Offensive line is so much technique and so much thinking involved and stunts and everything else. I think I think it's a more difficult position 
to acclimate yourself to in the NFL. Can I tell you why, Merrill? What? Here, here's why I think it's harder to play a line because you have to do it as a unit. Because if you yes. think about it, five guys have to be in sequence for one play. Yes. As a defensive guy, you all four guys up front, your front four, three guys could get blocked. One guy get around to play, make a play in the backfield, play's done. Yeah. When you're an offensive lineman, all guys have to be working, slipping and scooping and doing all the things. Yeah, it's, it will break it's down. More, it's, more it's a technical. group. It is more technical. Hit them long, Merrill. I appreciate you coming aboard. Thank you so much. Jesus, man, I'll never be on the links with you. Well, wait, 82s, I, 81s. I, I, I didn't say I'm long. I'm very, very straight, but I can hear the ball lands. <laughs> <laughs> Got that three wood working, don't you, Merrill? <laughs> no, I, I, I hit the driver, but I'm not. You know, no one's going to compare me to John Rom. But I'm, but, but, I, but I'm in very the good, my friend. Thank you so much for catching up and finding time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Always fun to be on with you. You bet. The legendary Merrill Reese. We're going to take a quick time out. Please hit the like button. Keep it here.